Hi guys, it is Gambas TV here, the artist formerly known on YouTube as Rock and Roll Rocks Out, and this is going to be the first video in my new series called Gambas Talk. And on this series, I'm going to be talking about all the different topics that interest me, which is mainly movies, music, and video games. Sometimes a little bit of politics if I have the the, uh, the energy to talk about politics. Mainly, it's going to be about movies and music. Those are the things that I'm most passionate about. I am an avid watcher and reviewer of movies, and I also like to make my own. I want to be a filmmaker when I'm older. I'm going to be going to film school next year. So so this series is going to be me giving my opinions on different film related topics. The first topic uh, that I'm going to be talking about in this video is objectivity versus subjectivity in film criticism. One of the thing, reasons why I'm most interested in this topic is because I'm an avid user of the website Letterboxd. For those of you who don't know what Letterboxd is, Letterboxd is a website where you can log and, and keep a diary of all the films you watch and it's used by people who range from just random movie fans to professional film critics and everyone keeps a diary of all the films they watch. They can keep lists of all the ranks kings of all their films for each year, they can categorise and make watch, watch lists for films they haven't seen, they can read other people's reviews, comment on them, and it's basically a big social network for people who love film. I'm not in any way affiliated with Letterboxd, but I can't advertise the website enough. It is a great sign. If you love film, I absolutely recommend you check it out. The reason why I bring up Letterboxd in this context is because being a big user of that website for like over a year now, uh, since the beginning of 2015, I have more and more found myself kind of analysing the way I approach movies. And because Letterboxd is a place that allows you to review films from your own kind of subjective perspective and kind of keep a blog of your opinions, uh, but also because it's got drama just like every other site, it's brought me to kind of think about what makes good criticism. Is there only one way of looking at movies and that's the right way? Are there multiple ways? Is it better to be objective and keep movies to certain standards and do a whole rating system that's very objective and nitpicks every single flaw with a film? Or is it best to be subjective and praise things, regardless of their flaws, that make you have a very positive emotional reaction and, and discuss films in the context of what they mean, what came before, what came after and what comes around the films? Do films exist in an objective vacuum? Or is it best to look at the films in their context? That is what I'm going to be talking about today, and that is heavily inspired by my heavy use of Letterbox and all the different discussions I've had on the site about film criticism. Now, if you've seen my Letterbox profile, you'll know that I'm completely biased on this issue. I put there right in my profile that I'm a very subjective critic. I say my ratings are based more on personal enjoyment and admiration rather than any objective formula. That's, of course, just about the rating, but also it goes into my writing as well. My reviews, they, I say that they gauge my emotional and intellectual reaction to a film based on my expectations for said film, given the genre, the style, the cast, the crew, the marketing, everything that goes into the film. And that's why you'll see me giving films like The Room which is obviously considered one of the worst movies of all time by lots of people, an actual positive rating because I think that films should be based on how uh, much value they are to individuals as opposed to just wh whether they fit into objective qualities. I couldn't possibly give The Room a half star rating even though obviously on a technical level it's quite a poor movie. Hey Johnny. Hey Mike. Oh, hey Danny. 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 Do you want to play some football? I've got to go see Michelle in a little bit to make out with her. Oh, so I'm sorry. Come on. Come on. So what I'm going to talk about now is pretty much my own opinions and philosophy. If you disagree with it, that is totally fine. Leave comments below to tell me what you think. Is subjective criticism better? Is objective criticism better? Tell me about your reviewing philosophy. If you are someone who reviews movies, if you're a user of Letterboxd, or if you just post your opinions online about films all the time, or just talk to your friends about films. Do you look at films based on how many plot holes they have, how good and accurate the story is? Do you base films on how much they entertained you, how much they made you laugh, if it's a comedy, how much they scared you, if it's a horror? Do you base things on some objective formula or are your reviews totally subjective and gauge your own personal response? So if you disagree with me, that's totally fine. It'd be super damaging if everyone agreed with everything anyway. So disagreement is what breeds discussion and discussion is the most important thing we can have. That's why everyone watches YouTube videos. That's why if you're watching this video by choice that you are watching it because you enjoy discussion and discussion is important, especially with criticism. That's the entire point, discussing movies. First, I want to give my opinion on what the difference between objectivity and subjectivity in criticism actually is. Obviously, everyone has different definitions of certain things and we all see things slightly differently. But the way I see objective criticism is criticism that reviews a film based solely on how well that film lives up to certain technical uh, standards, such as how many plot holes the film has, such as how good the effects are, how good the sound is, how accurate all the facts in the film is, how good the acting is, and so on and so on and so on. Objective reviews, regardless of whether the person actually like the film or not, I find, will generally give the film a bad or at least lower rating if the film has obvious flaws, regardless of whether the film was more entertaining than a film that is perfect. Uh, 
or more valuable or more emotionally impactful or whatever. This obviously goes a lot into the actual rating of films. Some people will give um, really positive reviews of a film in the, in the actual review and then give it a low rating and vice versa, they'll give it a really negative review or they'll say lots of flaws in the review and then they'll give it like a perfect rating. That's actually kind of how I work. I work based on my, uh, my own emotional reaction to a film as opposed to some objective standards. But an objective system would basically mean that if the review has like 70% positive things to say, 30% negative things to say, then the rating would end up being a 7 out of 10. But that's not how I work. Sometimes I watch a film and only half of it will be really good. But because that half of it was really, really good, I'll end up giving it like a 7 or an 8 out of 10 instead of the 5 that on an objective uh, scale it would actually deserve. And in terms of deciding what is good and what is bad, obviously this sometimes makes sense. Like, for instance, people often like to say that films with cheesy special effects, with really bad acting, bad dialogue, lots of plot holes and inconsistencies, ridiculous, unrealistic plots, bad movies, yet they seem to be entertained by these movies at the same time. Like, you've got Sharknado, you've got things like, you've got a whole industry of films that are made around so bad it's good. You know, we like to call films that have really bad special effects, that have a really low production values, bad quality, bad films, uh, even though in terms of entertainment value I see films that make us laugh, films that entertain us as being the opposite of bad. I discussed this in an article I wrote for Cinema Jams of Spread in June 2015 about movies considered so bad it's good. But that's a term which, along with my description of enjoying said films ironically as well as the, the term guilty pleasure in general, is a term I'm a bit, a bit skeptical of using now. But anyway, you can read that review to see what my opinion of this issue was back last year. One of the films I talked about in that article in, in, in depth was Birdemic, Shock and Terror, which is obviously considered by many people one of the worst films ever made. It's definitely, in terms of technical quality, one of the poorest films ever made, but nonetheless, one of the most entertaining films ever. Yeah, on a technical level, it's a very poorly made film with some of the most hilariously bad effects you're ever likely to see on the screen. But could I really ever, from the bottom of my heart, call it a bad movie? Hell no! It's quite simply an absolutely hilarious cinematic experience, one which on first viewing I laughed at 26 times. You can check that in my letterbox review where I actually did a calculation of every time I laughed. Now of course doing that calculation might have forced me to be a little bit more lenient, but nonetheless 26 times is a lot. A famous film critic Mark Commode has a system which he calls the six laugh test for comedy, whereby if a film elicits six or more laughs from him, that film has successfully staked its claim as a comedy. That of course is a subjective system in itself, you know, not everyone laughs only six times to a film they consider funny. Some people will laugh only two or three times and still consider a film one of the funniest films of all time. Different people have different capacities for laughter. Some people laugh more easily than others. Nonetheless, it's a system that kind of works for me. You know, the average comedy film, I'll probably laugh half a dozen times at if it's a pretty good comedy film, like a, a six or a seven out of 10, you know, maybe a, a 10 out of 10 comedy I'd laugh at, you know, um, 30 or 40 times. But the average one I probably laugh at between like six and 50. 15 times, let's say. So that's a pretty good system, and considering that I laughed 26 times at Birdemic, I can hardly say that it's a film that uh, I would consider unforgivable on my own rating system. You can see my top rating is unforgettable, my lowest rating is unforgivable, and uh, could I really give Birdemic unforgivable a half star rating? Even though the vast majority of people who reviewed that film on Letterboxd gave it a half star rating, could I really say that it's an unforgivable movie? Could I say that I hated it or even disliked it? Hell no, I really liked that movie, so I gave it a four-star rating. That's what I think it deserves, and in the context of what it is, I think it's a great film, even though it's really bad on technical standards. That's kind of why I value subjectivity as opposed to objectivity. I don't often laugh out loud, even when I find something that's really funny. And that's kind of why I like the new system on Facebook with the reactions, because uh, I can like memes and I kind of half chuckle at, but then I can actually put the laugh uh, emoji on the, the memes that actually made me laugh out loud, which is rare. So if you see me putting a laugh emoji on something, if, you, if you're on Facebook with me, that means I genuinely laughed out loud. Of course, like everything, my rating system is a subjective one that works solely for me, and I couldn't advocate that everyone use the same system or review films in the same way. I think if you review films, you should use the rating system that works for you, and you should try and follow critics that have a system that you could understand. That, uh, that could bring us into a cycle where objectivity could be seen as someone's subjectivity, and so on and so on, and scooby dooby doo uh, we could talk about this all day. Don't get me wrong, objectivity is sometimes valuable. It's important to keep art up to high technical standards. But it's not something that really personally drives the way I look at movies, especially when the objectivity is not part of some wider context that releases films from the kind of grasp of just being good on all these different technical levels. And so what I mean by context is evaluating films based on their intent, what they are, what they represent, what they're for, as opposed to just basing them every single film on the same set of standards.
I don't really think it's valuable to simply say that films that have lower production values, more plot holes, less consistently, see, that are less accurate, are on some level worse than films that are more perfectionist. Even though we should be like fighting for perfectionism, we should encourage films to have better standards on every single level. Simply basing them on these standards when we review the films, I don't think that's very healthy because I think that it lets out films that have more sincerity, more passion, more vision, as opposed to films that stick to very boring, consistent rules that don't really do anything to kind of push boundaries, change cinema, inspire us, give us new experiences, which I really think is the main point of cinema. Giving us new experiences, being an act of escapism, a form of allowing us to walk into a movie theatre and have a completely different, different experience, go to a different world, go, live in someone else's shoes, and just see things in a new way for an hour and a half to two hours to three hours even and just, just learn a little bit about something else and be inspired, be entertained. Just leave the real world for a little bit and learn a little bit in the process. But in terms of the films that I consider masterpieces, that I consider my favourite films, they're not films that are perfect, that have no plot holes, no flaws, nothing like that. Obviously many of the films that I consider my favourite are like pretty damn good in all of those categories, but generally what makes a film like amazing for me is the passion behind the film, the sincerity of the film, and having all of the elements of that film working in unison together to create a specific atmosphere, a specific location, a specific plot, a specific idea, a specific feeling, a specific tone, a specific form of escapism. That is, for me, what makes a masterpiece. And the kind of films that I often enjoy are not always the sort of films that the average person or everyone enjoys. I like films that are weird, that are that, that are structurally, you know, different, that don't follow a specific structure. And not everyone uh, is a fan of that kind of system, and that's totally fine. Everyone has their own way of looking at films. Everyone has their own opinions. So a masterpiece is not a film that I look at and go, wow, that has really, like, 10 out of 10, every category. Uh, the acting was great, the script was great, the music was great, the effects were great, the cinematography was great. I, obviously, I do respond to all of those different things, and certain, in certain films, certain elements will go, will, make, will, like, will stand out to me, make me go, wow. But what makes a masterpiece for me is simply a film that has a huge impact on me, that leaves a great impression, a great positive impression, and kind of seeps into me, becomes a part of me. Now on Letterboxd I've rated 168 films as 5 star reviews out of the almost 2,000 films that I've watched. Obviously 168 is a lot, there are some people that have given way more 5 star ratings than that, some people that have given way less 5 star ratings than that. But nonetheless, I think at this moment in time I could defend all 168 of those films. Some of them are like miniseries, some of them are TV shows, and some of them are um, uh, short films that have kind of worked their way on Letterboxd as well. But generally, with all of those things that I've given five star ratings to, I could defend, even if they're way flawed, in many of the film cases there are definite, obvious flaws that I have mentioned before. Um, nonetheless, I could defend all of those films as being films that left a massive impact on me, and that I consider a kind of, I'm not, not, not in every case life-changing, but certainly life-affecting uh, film-going experience. Films that made me think deeply, or gave me a, a huge level of entertainment, that kind of, and that have stuck with me since because of their, often because of their aesthetic qualities. Simply, often the colour palette of a film can make it a masterpiece for me, even if other elements aren't quite as interesting. Like the film Fehalothia, which is a classic animated film, I think from Hungary, from the 80s. That is one of my favourite films of all time, simply because it is one of the most visually creative films and original films I've ever seen in that regard. Would everyone who ever watches that film think it's a masterpiece? No, not everyone who watches it is going to like it. Some people will be incredibly bored. But simply because of the artistry behind it, I was able to find it a masterpiece and call it one of my favourite films of all time. That's just my subjective opinion. That's why I value subjectivity. You know, this talk of what I consider a masterpiece, what I consider a great movie, could just be, uh, I guess, construed by some people as my own form of objective formula. But really, my reviews are not based on any kind of in, uh, like mental evaluation of what makes a film good. I don't nitpick and analyse every film as I'm going along. I don't count every single detail that I think is good or bad. I watch the film, and then after, I try to put my own emotional reaction into some kind of context kind of thinking of why that film made me bored, why that film made me happy, why that film made me sad, whether that reaction was a positive reaction or a negative one. And kind of predict the lasting value that the film has, and for me, lasting value is kind of the most important thing when evaluating a film. Even if I think a film, 
passes every single like test in terms of quality. If I don't think the film will have lasting value, if I don't think the film is that interesting or you know original or adds much to any kind of discussion, and if I don't think the film had that much of an impact on me personally, I can't really give that film a highly positive rating. Certainly not a 5 out of 5 or a 10 out of 10. And because I put my emotional reaction to a film first, I am obliged to give films that have glaring flaws but that I nonetheless really enjoy. Higher ratings are films that I can't find any flaws with that nonetheless didn't excite me, didn't interest me, horror films that didn't scare me, comedies that didn't make me laugh. Even if I watch a comedy and I can't find reasons why it's not funny, if I didn't find it funny I can't give it a positive review and I try to analyse that uh, in the context of my reaction after watching it. Big case in point, Gods of Egypt, a film that received almost exclusively negative reviews and that has some pretty obvious glaring flaws, not to mention the unacceptable whitewashing of the cast the cheesy acting, the hilariously over-the-top dialogue. Now that said, it was, for me, uh, one of the most enjoyable movie-watching experiences of the year, and in terms of originality, in terms of expressiveness, in terms of its colourful, aesthetic qualities, and its pure entertainment value, it was an absolutely inspiring, even empowering film. And I totally acknowledge all the flaws of the film, and I definitely believe that those flaws should be mentioned in, in, in any review of, by anyone who notices those flaws and has any opinion of those flaws. And so in, in the writing of the review, I would still, uh, I think I still mentioned everything that was wrong with Gods of Egypt, but I nonetheless had to analyse the context of my emotional reaction to the film, and the fact that it sold me on the joys of filmmaking, genuinely sold me on the joys, the power of filmmaking, and art in general, uh, pretty much better than any film I'd seen since maybe Mad Max Fury Road, I had no choice but to slap on that 4.5 out of 5, at, i.e. 9 out of 10 rating on Letterboxd. And I might even bump it up to a 10 uh, in the future if a rewatch elicits the same powerful reaction. I've only seen it once, but the film has stuck with me way more than pretty much uh, like almost any film I have seen since I saw that, besides a few classics. So yeah, I'm basically saying that you can give 10 out of 10 ratings, and you should give 10 out of 10 ratings. Obviously everyone has their own system, but I, I am a passionate defender of people giving 10 out of 10 ratings to films that are highly, heavily flawed. And I am, in fact, a huge supporter of the flawed masterpiece theory. This is a theory that's, uh, I don't know, uh, controversial is not, not really the most accurate way of putting it, but I have seen people complain about flawed masterpieces in, in comments and stuff before in the past. So I do think there is kind of a little bit of a discussion that can be had there. I personally think that masterpieces can, and often usually are, flawed, because ha being flawed, being a uh, being passionate, being having lots of vision, often makes films fundamentally flawed, makes films certainly not accessible to everybody that watches them. And that's what makes them special, that's what makes them an important part of cinema. Many of my all-time favourites are very, very divisive movies. You've got, you got 2001, A Space Odyssey. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. You've got Babel. Call my embassy. Where are you? Where are we? I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Under the Skin. Under the Skin is a boring, plodding, incompetent, pretentiously hollow, and direly handled piece of garbage. And what's most depressing is that it's getting so much attention and praise precisely because it is a boring, plodding, incompetent, pretentiously hollow, and direly handled piece of garbage. Zidane, a 21st century portrait. Tanakh Wat, The Fast Runner, I don't know if I pronounced that right, but it's an incredible film um, made by Inuits uh, up, in, up in northern Canada. And that's an absolute masterpiece, in my opinion, but I've seen reviews that were really negative, oftentimes in reference to the low production values of that film. Though I wouldn't say that it's low production values, I just say that it has um, it's a it's low budget, obviously. And, of course, The Tree of Life, a very, very divisive film that had people walking out at Cannes. In the end, it got like mainly really good reviews, and, and it's you know it was Oscar nominated and all that stuff, but still a divisive movie, the sort of movie that um, it's not everyone's cup of tea. I wouldn't recommend The Tree of Life to everyone who just wants to watch movies casually. Though I do think films like that that are divisive should be watched by every uh, uh, cinephile, everyone who wants to have a bigger understanding of, of cinema in general. And of course. I'm not perfect in that category either. There are thousands of films that are great films that I have still yet to see and that are outside of my comfort zone, but you know, challenging my comfort zone, uh, I've always found to be beneficial, even if I didn't end up liking the film that everyone else called a masterpiece.
Obviously all the films that I just mentioned uh, are films that are widely considered great movies, classics, masterpieces, whatever. But all of them also have people that are huge detractors of the film that, are, that I've seen give as low as half a star ratings to pretty much all of those films. Because you know they're not films that are 100% accessible to every audience. They're films that, that do have certain flaws, in many cases glaring flaws, or at least low production values, at least inconsistencies, that keep absolutely everyone from enjoying them. But I nonetheless think that they're masterpieces because they left a massive impression on me and inspired me to want to make movies and to, to want to analyse movies a bit more deeply. And so I think recognising that, recognising that films can be flawed but still very valuable, i.e. in a subjective manner, and, and advocating for things that we personally are affected by and, and you, know, you know, kind of criticising things that, that even being perfect uh, on technical levels did not affect us, that is important. That it's important to be honest about your own reaction to films as opposed to just keeping up to certain standards and trying to, you know, be someone who gets everything right. No one could ever be 100% accurate in saying if a film is good or bad or not. There will never be, in my opinion, objective standards that say what makes good cinema. Maybe the robots, maybe the AI will figure out how to make a great movie one day and will have perfect objective standards that make original, creative, uh, entertaining, enjoyable films every single time. But I don't think those, art, the, those objective standards could ever exist. I think art is entirely subjective and nothing ever exists in a vacuum. Everyone who goes into a film already has preconceptions, already has biases. We've all seen trailers. I try to avoid watching trailers so I can go in as blind as possible. But everyone's seen trailers. Everyone, everyone knows, you know, a little bit about the film they're going into, and everyone has preconceptions. And those preconceptions will, whether you like it or not, affect the way you watch a film. There, are, you know, there are times where you can go into a film expecting to hate it and end up loving it, and vice versa. But nonetheless, our own biases will subconsciously affect how we appreciate a film. And that will just mean that different people see different films in different ways. And I think being honest about that, being subjective in your reviews, and uh, giving the reasons why you think you had your own specific reaction, is the best thing we can do to add to the discourse, to add to the discussion, and to put films in a, a more in a more nuanced, I guess, context. Nuance is a word I really love. We need more nuance in discussion about films and in discussion about everything in general, especially politics, because I think YouTube is just an absolute mess when it comes to lack of nuance in politics. So, in conclusion of all that, yes, I think there are techniques and there are ways to make films up to certain standards, and obviously we should advocate for, people, for films to have, you know, you know, good production values, to be consistent, to be accurate as possible, and to be as representative as possible, uh, certainly. But I also think that there is something also to be said about passion, and vision, and creativity, and originality, that are kind of separate from all the objective qualities that go into filmmaking. You might disagree, you might have your own standards of reviewing films, and that's totally fine, but that's what my opinion on the whole objective versus subjective criticism debate is. And that's what makes me appreciate films more, is a bit of subjectivity, a bit of understanding more of the context of films, rather than just reviewing each film as only the product we see on screen, as only the way that film lives up to certain standards. And so I want to go talk about a little bit about politically charged film reviews. Uh, most film critics out there, most movie reviewers, they just review the film based on what the film is, how it fits into its genre, its style, and that's totally fine, that's totally valuable. But there are certain critics out there who give their film reviews and their whatever reviews, their music reviews, their TV reviews, whatever, a political perspective, and that put, that go into the film looking at, looking at it from the perspective of, say, a feminist and they will go into the film and they will review the film based on how well it lives up to certain criteria. That, I guess, can be construed as a bit objective because it, it bases all films based on certain categories, and that's not exactly how I review films, although obviously I do have political biases. I'm a very, you know, pretty liberal, progressive person, and that does affect how I review my films, and you'll see that if you read some of my letterbox reviews. But I think that individually, politically charged reviewers who, uh, you know, completely from the start, admit that they're going to be reviewing things from a certain perspective, a certain subjective perspective, even if that subjective perspective is an objective perspective, and yada yada yada. Um, I think those kind of reviewers are valuable and do add to the discourse and we shouldn't be hating on people, even if we disagree with them politically, for putting a political perspective on films and analysing the films based on the film's political context in a wider sociological, economic, political, whatever perspective it is. Certain reviewers, especially on Letterbox, I've seen have got a lot of hate for going political in their reviews and I think that hate is totally unjustified. If you want to review your films from a political perspective, that's totally your choice, you should absolutely do it, and it will only make the discourse about a film more nuanced. And if you see a review that challenges a film that you love based on political criteria, don't just hate on it, don't just completely disregard it. I, I, in my opinion, you should read that review, you should take that review seriously, and actually in the past I've had my opinions of films not only just changed, but completely just kind of 
completely made into a mess because of a review that I saw that challenged a film that I liked as being you know, problematic in some way. And I think that's totally fine. I think that's important. And I think we can still love the films that we love and be honest about our own reactions to the films. But understand there's more to films than just our own reaction, just what we think of a film. And that films have so many different elements going into, in and out of each other and connecting, that everything is so nuanced and complicated. And it's best to be try and kind of take in all those nuances, but still be honest about what we think of the film, but still uh, discuss the film. Even if we still like a film after having someone slam it on political terms, it's still important to understand why they did what they did and recognise uh, what they pointed out, even if we still disagree. To summarise though, there's much more to a film than just the sum of its technical parts, and I think it's up to each individual critic, each person who analyses movies, to be as honest and as subjective as possible in understanding why they had their own personal reaction to a film. Uh, that will add to the discourse in a much more valuable way than just saying each film has this plot hole, that plot hole, th this film has this effect, this film has that effect. Yes, certain technical objective critics are valuable and important. And people who are populist and review, and, and review films based on certain standards that, that are, are accessible to everyone are valuable as well, but I also think that each individual person having their own perspective and giving their own individual perspective on films is just as valuable in adding to the discourse. And, and many of the, the critics that I love the most that I read the most and follow the most are ones that have their own obvious bent and go into their films with a specific mindset and, and review films in analysis of that mindset as opposed to just being people who review things in a very populist, accessible way. Uh, obviously there are critics I also follow that are more accessible as well and, that's, and they're, they're totally valuable. People who review things as more of a buyer's guide, obviously valuable as well. But for me, the more subjective way of reviewing films is the more valuable one. And well guys, if you've watched to the end of this video, I'm really, really like happy that you did that. Um, this is a really rambly video, you know, uh, my first time doing this and I'm really glad that you put you the time in to listen to my argument and I hope you enjoyed my argument. Obviously there's a lot more refining to be done, I missed out tons of things that I wanted to talk about. This is already a really long video, one of the longest I've ever made. So um, let me know in the comments below what you thought of my argument. Did you agree with me? Did you, did you disagree with me? What is important? Objective criticism? Subjective criticism. Am I totally wrong? Am I totally an idiot? Let me know if that's true in the comments. If you think I was totally right, also let me know in the comments. My main goal is to add to the discussion about film criticism, about movies in general. Let me know what for you makes a good movie, what for you makes a bad movie, what's a masterpiece. Are there objective standards that we can live to? Or is everyone's own opinion subjective and emotional? Thanks for watching Gambus Talk. Follow this channel for more conversation on movies, on music, on all different things that go into our discussion of media. Make sure to like and to comment and to subscribe. Go and check out my other videos if you enjoyed this one. Stay tuned for more. Thanks. Goodbye.